being focused on Sabina Alkira's work and the question of how COVID-19 will affect the multidimensionally poor. But before we get to that, I just want to say something about this series. What's it for? What are we trying to achieve? The purpose of this series is to really showcase the best of Oxford international development and make it accessible to a wider public audience. At the moment, with the challenges created by the current pandemic, international development is perhaps more important than ever. Being able to engage thoughtfully with the new world that we face and the challenges it poses around the world is a major and striking imperative. And so what we're trying to do in this series is convene thinkers who are focused on different themes in international development, different regions of the world, um, and make their work and the way in which their research connects to the pandemic accessible within and across Oxford to other students and academics, but also the public at, at large. And we've got um, presentations during the next eight weeks that focus on China, India, Latin America, Europe, migration, human rights, politics, economics. There is literally something for everyone. And the series is jointly convened by the Oxford Department of International Development and also the Oxford Society for International Development, a student-led society. And so I'm joined by my fellow co-convener, Harry Crichton Miller, who's vice president of that society, and he'll also introduce himself. Go ahead, Harry. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so exactly like Alex said, I'm Harry. I'm co-moderating this event alongside the brilliant Alex. Um, I'm the current vice president of the Oxford Society for International Development, and we're very, very excited to be bringing you this series today. Um, obviously, in normal, more normal times, we have the privilege of engaging Oxford University students and the public on some of these key issues in a more traditional format, in events, etc. But given the unique challenges this global pandemic poses, it's it's brilliant that we can, we can do this here today. Um, if you're a student or otherwise interested, just check us out on Facebook or on the website at opsid.org. Of course. Um, and yeah, that's that's about it. One finally, I did want to say a huge thank you both to Alex and to Sabina for giving up their time and putting in all this work to put this together today. Um, but yeah, back to you, Alex. And generally seminars and presentations will be on Mondays at two o'clock, but there's a bit of variation to that. So check out the wider schedule for the term and we'll be adding to it on a rolling basis. Most will be in this format, but some will be podcast and there'll be a range of um, resources put out on the, um, the series uh, web page. Um, but without further ado, I'm really pleased to welcome Professor Sabina Alkira um, a colleague of ours in the Oxford Department of International Development. Sabina is Director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, OFI. And throughout her work and her career, she's really done pioneering research on what's called multidimensional poverty, taking the idea of how we measure and understanding poverty beyond just simple measures of GDP to really think about what it is that contributes to human welfare. And amongst the many prizes that OFI has received include the Queen's Anniversary Prize, a real recognition that this is work that is not just abstract academic research, but is contributing to changing lives uh, of some of the poorest around the world. So I can't think of anyone better suited to tell us a little bit about how COVID-19 may affect uh, the global poor. So Sabina, over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Alex and Harry, and thanks to all of you who are joining online. I hope that you and your families are well in these difficult times. Um, today, I'm going to focus a bit on looking outside of ourselves to see what the COVID impact might be on people who already struggle with a number of deprivations at the same time. And first of all, try to understand that world of interlocked, interwoven, complex deprivations that people are already navigating, and then how COVID might have affected them, and how we can use some numbers or some learning from friends or some techniques to try to quantify uh, the impact that COVID is having on poverty. Because clearly, we would not like um, this lead to the predicted increases in poverty that we are already hearing about in the press. And so we view COVID and the um, ensuing recession with great trepidation. 
But I'll also end on a positive note um, with some examples of how even in the toughest of times, sometimes a corner is turned. So the starting point today is on non-monetary aspect of people's lives. Those people may be monetary poor, not having enough income, or they may not. But we're looking at people who experience several things going wrong at the same time, maybe deprivations in education or housing or work or violence or uh, living standards and quality of life. And what we observe when we look at the interlinkages between those deprivations is that they are incredible. So what I'd like to start with is just thinking about 10 indicators that happen to be included in a global multidimensional poverty index I'll cover later. And let's just think about what it would be like to experience those deprivations. They also link to the sustainable development goals that some of you will have studied. So the database looks at each person within their household and at the deprivations they and household members are considering at the same time. Is anybody in your household undernourished? Is the child very sadly died in the last five years? Does nobody in the household have enough six years of schooling? Is there a child out of school up to the age at which they complete class eight? Do you lack clean cooking fuel, adequate sanitation, safe drinking water, electricity, good quality housing, and more than one of a few small assets? So people who lack these may also lack other deprivations that are of great interest, like they may have precarious, informal or unsafe jobs. They may be subject to violence. But this is the starting point that I'm going to talk about today. And thinking now about people in context of their households and the different things they carry at the same time. And so a first observation is that the interlinkages across deprivations are incredible. So the global MPI covers 5.7 billion people and 72% of them have at least one deprivation in one of these indicators. But on average, those people are deprived in five to six indicators at the same time. Indeed, between 81 and 99% of people deprived in each indicator experience at least one more deprivation. So for example, if you look at the diagram below and you look at electricity, which is um, on the far right of the top corner, you can see that the first bar is the people who are only deprived in electricity and in none of the other indicators. And it's tiny because 99% of people who are deprived in electricity are also deprived in at least one of those other indicators. And each column refers to another indicator that people are deprived in. So we are now looking at poverty from an angle to try to really be curious about the lived experience of poverty and what's going right and wrong in people's lives at the same time. And it seems that there's a lot of overlap. But then when we look further, we see that people's deprivation loads are not the same across different households, different countries, different people groups. I'll give one example. 14% of people might be sharing their house with an out-of-school child. And 14% have nobody who's completed a critical mass of schooling. So a natural question, and these are real numbers, are these people the same? And the answer is, only 5% have both deprivations, but 9% of people only have one or two of the other educational deprivations. So there are lots of mismatches that are going on between different indicator pairs. So it's, it's a task to understand how they're poor and then to think of what COVID might be doing in this environment. So to do this, we build a profile for each person of the deprivations where a shaded box is what they're deprived in and a white box is what they're not deprived in. We sort the indicators into three dimensions and then create a deprivation score. And then you can define people as poor if they're deprived in a critical mass. For example, in 33%, one third of the weighted indicators. 
So that's what a global multidimensional poverty index does, where we actually use the cutoff of one third and have three dimensions equally weighted of health, education, and living standards. And what do we find? We find that of the 1.3 billion people who are identified by the MPI, 98.8% of them have at least three deprivations going on at the same time. So in that population, we are capturing uh, already an overlap and over 80% have five at the same time. So I'd like to just step back and think about our lives. For many of us, COVID-19 is a shocking exposure to a new threat and it's scary and it's changed our lives. None of us will ever forget the past few months. But for people who are already deprived in three, five, seven, nine, or more things at the same time, it's an additional threat, but to an already extensive deprivation load. And so we have to understand it's now not the only thing that they are facing. It's, it's one of many. And yet it also can have a tragic impact, either directly or indirectly on their lives. So when we think about the impact, we have to be clear on the starting position, the starting condition of people, and then how COVID could exacerbate that. So I'll start just basically with trying to understand what we can do with data. We're a quantitative research center. Every single number that I talk about is done in collaboration with my colleagues um, who compute the global MPI data set, Usha Kanagaratnam and Nikolai Sapa, who have done the COVID briefings, Jacob Dirksen, Ricardo Nogales, Christian Oldegas, um, and many of the other colleagues at OFI who have done national poverty studies, vulnerability studies, and other projections. But there are two fundamental concerns we have. One is how can we use data to look at those who are very sadly at higher risk of fatality because of COVID-19? And how can we identify them and in the emergency phase, try to inform those who are acting about the populations that need special protection, uh, special kinds of support? And the second is how can we try to reduce the collateral cost, the human cost of the pandemic and ensuing reception? You've heard it said that there's a danger in some situations that the effect of the lockdown on poor people's lives could have a bigger human cost than COVID itself. So we have to think of both of those when people lose their work, when they are crowded in together, and again, we're not considering all of the deprivations like data relationships within the household, but what can we do and how can data help? So just a couple um, examples. The first example draws on the global MPI data set, but not yet identifying who's poor, just taking that environment of 10 harmonized indicators. Let's think about three of those indicators that might lead to a higher uh, risk of a deep COVID impact. One is undernutrition, which weakens the immune system and which puts people at risk in many ways, including children, but also including older people and men and women alike. A second is not having water, having water or not having clean water. So this affects not only hand washing, but also drinking and again, exposure to different kinds of disease and risks. And the third is cooking fuel. You may say, why cooking fuel? Well, COVID attacks the lungs, and one of the leading causes of deaths in uh, developing countries come from acute respiratory infections, and those are often driven by indoor air pollution uh, caused by cooking a solid fuel, like wood or dung or charcoal. So solid cooking can also be a COVID-19 risk factor among the poor. So simply taking the existing data I already showed to you, we looked at, okay, of those 5.7 million people, how many experience one of those risk factors? It's 3.6 billion. Um, and how many, very sadly, have all three at the same time? 
somebody in their household's malnourished, they don't have clean water within a 30 minute walk, and they cook with a solid cooking fuel. And it's 472 million. And so one first step is simply to try to see where they are. We look at the number and we look at the level of poverty, uh, sorry, of, of these covariate risks, these comorbidities as it were, um, with the COVID. So this is a, a map of the number of people who are at high risk, those 472 million. Um, and it also has at the time, this was a, a briefing, our first briefing on COVID that came out in April, at the time, the COVID burden um, in those countries. And we disaggregate global MPI by ages, by rural urban areas, by subnational regions. So this is Nigeria. And you can see with Nigeria, the overlap between those three COVID risk factors is not the same, but it's quite different. And you can see that again, when we did this, the COVID was in the South, which was had, had lower risk factors, but if it goes into the North, it's effect could be different. And that can be done uh, with subnational analysis across all of the regions that we cover. For example, our most recent briefing is in Africa. It includes um, uh, the different regions, subnational regions, and we look at the proportion of poor, which is a big map, and the number of poor. Because if you are in government office and you're trying to target, you need to know the number of people because you're gonna be delivering a benefit. But if you're trying as an international agency to figure out where the prevalence is higher, you'd like to look at the proportion. So it's important to look at both. And if you don't like maps, then the right-hand side figure shows the average number of people at a country level who have all three COVID risk factors. And the red bubbles show how this varies between subnational regions of that country with very low ones at the bottom and very high ones at the top. So what this set of work is saying is that the potential health impact, the comorbidities of the already poor vary. They vary a lot within countries. And so the emergency response will have to consider these. Although these are not the only uh, very important indicators to consider, as I'll come to in a moment. So, one second um, piece of work which is underway is then to answer the question, well, how many more people will become poor because of the impact of COVID? Now, that's a complicated question. None of us know and all of us hope that it will be lower than we think. Um, so what we have done has been to try to collect as they come out um, anticipated impacts of COVID on the indicators of the global MPI. For example, the World Food Program tracking the increase in severe in food insecurity, or those tracking the current number of children who are out of school, or tracking rural urban migration, sorry, urban rural migration, um, because urban people going to rural areas may move to households that have other kinds of deprivations and living standards. And so trying to quantify that, cast the years forward to the present, look at the impact of COVID, and then see how many years we are being set back in terms of global MPI. That work is with colleagues at OFI and will come out uh, in July. But there is another level of work. Global work is fine, but it's not really tailored to the context. It's tailored to the data sets, tailored to the particular policy moment in which an emergency response is crafted or the bedrock for a post-emergency social protection package is drawn up. And so in this second kind of work, um, there's a different kind of a need. One is to uh, identify using whatever data sets one can, COVID vulnerability for the targeting exercises that are underway. And some governments are targeting by repurposing their census data or their registry data of the people who are currently receiving benefits to extend it um, and to give a greater portion of transfers to the already existing lists of beneficiaries or to extend them. Um, and in extending them to engage and identify the existing and new poor. And there's also a need for more data. Every household survey that I know of is paused in the field. And we who work on poverty, we need household surveys. And so there's a lot of innovation going on 
and to try to undertake rapid remote surveys of the impact on socioeconomic variables um, with World Bank, UNICEF, and other agencies. And the hope is that they will include core aspects of multidimensional poverty so that we can do just-in-time analyses. Um, but we have a lot to learn of how to obtain rigorous, uh, well-sampled data uh, from those surveys. And then there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, and I'll give you one example of that and then talk about the post emergency situation. So at the national level, in addition to the variables we've already discussed, um, multidimensional vulnerability indices are useful um, because they can put under one roof, as it were, a lot of considerations. You hear on television, um, you hear people speaking about the problems of overcrowding, of informal people, uh, informal employment, and people lo losing their jobs and their livelihoods, of households where older people are exposed because they're living with ones, of people who lack hand washing facilities or don't have a mobile phone so they can't receive an SMS of how to obtain their emergency response. So there are lots of other variables. And if a government receives a report which has uh, 10, 15, 20 indicators and a re re um, an account of each one of those, it's really quite baffling. And so a multidimensional vulnerability index uses the measurement methodology I described before to try to put these indicators under one roof and ask the question of priority. Who is most vulnerable? Where should the emergency resources be directed quickly and now? And the vulnerability indexes that OFI have done, and we've done them with a number of country governments, sometimes use these remote rapid surveys, sometimes use uh, other surveys or existing data sets that the governments had. They're not perfect. And um, we have to really be different than we are if we're trying to publish in a top journal. We have to use the data that exists and cut some corners in order to obtain a response that is timely and meets the need of the moment. And this is a good example where uh, the perfect is, is perhaps not the best way forward. Um, I'd like also to give you an example of how we are learning from the countries that are working so hard. So OFI, our research center, it, in 2013, we're privileged to be the part of the launch of a South-South network, which now has 60 countries and a number of international agencies as participants. And the participants in both statistical offices and policy offices are those who focus on poverty. So when COVID struck, um, we very much uh, realized that we are in conversation with the people who are now crafting these different emergency responses. So uh, we are having different interactions, teleconferences, trying to learn in a very, very busy time how, what other people are doing in their own situation so that we can think forward and innovate together. So this is a briefing um, organized by uh, Felipe Roque Clavijo, who finished his DPhil in our department recently. And it's with the head of statistics in Colombia. And Colombia has had a national MPI since the year 2011. And um, they also include 14 of their 15 MPI indicators in their census. And their MPI has five dimensions and 15 indicators. And so when COVID-19 struck, they were able to use their census-based MPI within two weeks um, in order to target families that did not receive conditional cash transfers, but were in, deprived in other indicators of their national MPI. The national MPI includes indicators that are not possible in the global MPI, like informal work, child labor, overcrowding, et cetera. And so they were able to include some of those indicators as well as other important from the census. And they then made census maps that are very high resolution to plot the response. So you're looking at a map of Bogota um, with all of the details, the high, hotter pink showing in a sense, the nexuses of poverty being. They also uh, merged their MPI with their health records data. And they did that in order to look at urban patterns of contagion 
in over 1,000 municipalities, which are local areas. And so in that case, they were able to use multidimensional poverty metrics um, quite quickly off the bat, um, but extend them in ways that were appropriate for the crisis. And other governments are learning from them and also doing it uh, differently. And so it's a time in the world of people working on poverty when we see people working all hours of day and night, working terribly hard, but also really trying to think how they can use their professional tools um, to try to do something constructive in the face of this difficult time. Uh, so that's what we are trying to learn and showcase is how they are doing it. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is in a sense, the need to escalate the issue, issue of poverty post COVID. And for some of you who are watching, you might have a little bit of time and maybe you could write, maybe you could um, try to put some of these issues out in the public space in different ways. Um, it's a time when many hands make light work. There was a article which is on the screen by Martia Sen, which came out April 15th in the Financial Times. And he observes, as others have, that there was a sharp reduction in undernutrition in Britain during the Second World War when there were food shortages and a reduction in the total food availability. Um, but there were proactive social policies. And he observes during the decade previous to the war, men's life expectancies went up by 1.2 years. But in the decade of the 1940s, male life expectancy went up by six and a half years and that of women by seven years. Now this is counterintuitive. There was a food decline, <laughs> there was a war, and yet life expectancy went up. And the question is, if the same kind of proactive social policies that meant that we turned a corner um, could also be possible in the present crisis, he asks. Um, and it's not written in stone. There are other examples, of course, during that same period of time when the social economic lo deprivation loads that poor people carry went up starkly. And so the hope is that if, if we can escalate hope and if we can escalate you know, poverty as a firm commitment, it might be possible even in this terrible time um, to invest and make a historic shift in poverty, but also as other speakers in this talk will look at in climate, which is a huge priority um, at this time. But you say that's, that's perhaps a little bit unrealistic. So let me give another example. Um, Pedro Consensao, who is the director of the Human Development Report Office, um, was in Sierra Leone uh, during the very difficult Ebola crisis. And that is a very different crisis than the COVID-19. Um, and yet there were a few similarities. It, was, it also had school lockdowns. It also had restrictions on movement. It also had impacts on the health systems. Um, and it happened from December 2013 to March 2016. But it did not necessarily, it seems, create a widespread slide into poverty. In numbers that we'll release together in July, we found that among a group of over 75 countries, Sierra Leone had actually the fastest reduction in multidimensional poverty, reducing it from 74% in 2013 to 58% in 2016, 2017, um, the, the years when the Ebola pandemic raged um, and then was brought under control. And it clearly was not perfect because pandemics, as we now know, require responses at galloping speed. Human error, as well as tragedy, are inevitable. And so things were not perfect. They did not go right, perhaps. And yet it seems to be that this example shows that it was possible during that time to take a significant fo step forward in reducing multidimensional And I think it's hoped that the current crisis would be able, in a sense, to invite different kinds of action. Um, and so that we could use the data and the tools, the analysis that we have to try to understand the cost of COVID-19 in the short term on poor people's lives, but also of the pandemic and the recession in the longer term. And 
Um, so therefore work to turn that corner and to prevent the increase in poverty, even though our projections may be predicting a very strong increase. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sabina. That's really inspiring. And you've really highlighted how the MPI can shine a light on where the greatest vulnerabilities are and in how policymakers should perhaps prioritize both regions and particular populations. Um, we've got a lot of questions already coming in. For those of you in the audience, if you could enter your questions in the chat box, that would be terrific. We'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, given the number of people on the call, we've got about 170 people on this Zoom call. Uh, we can't come to you individually. So if you type up your questions, we'll read out as many as we possibly can. And so Harry, would you like to ask the first question? Yeah, I think it was uh, Jennifer Bevan who asked, um, I'm interested to know how COVID-19 will also impact the future participation of the corporate world towards the sustainable development goals. Davina, um, any thoughts? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and one of the difficulties of this format is that I can't ask you to answer questions, but I'm sure many of you who are watching this have better answers than I do. Um, but it's a very good question of how the corporate world will respond to COVID in, in terms of poverty. And I think that there's some strengths that they have. For example, I spoke of the need to have quick surveys, but corporations are used to having market, marketing surveys. They're used to remote technologies and fast data processing methods. And so there might be a nice partnership that could be arranged there in terms of obtaining data about poor people and their families, but they would need to be complemented by the kind of uh, data which are, are normal for statistical offices. There's also, I think, um, a reality that without their engagement, we won't make progress as fast as if they are engaged. Um, and we at OFI spun off a, a social enterprise called Sophia, which is working with corporations that are doing an MPI, that is the national MPI for their country, on their own employees, beginning with the CEO, and it's voluntary and they're clear ethical protections, but it enables them to see which of their employee base are multidimensionally poor. And so at very least in, at the home front, they can address those deprivations and at the same time, try to build solidarity and um, recognition of the humanity of, of one's co-workers into the picture. And hopefully that would then also go down the value chain or the communities in which those corporations work. So I think it is a good question. It's one to be explored. And again, I hope um, some people on this call can do far more than a small research center are, are able to do. Sabina, there's a really interesting question that's come in um, from an anonymous person, and it says, do you think you need any new parameters or indicators within the MPI as a result of COVID-19? Does COVID-19 challenge your thinking and make you think you need to add any indicators that might not be present in the MPI? Yeah, no, I think that that's, that's a fantastic question. We already, would like to add in the MPI indicators that we don't have, like employment, like violence, like um, empowerment, um, and in, in environmental or climactic conditions, and the data don't permit be permitted. But I think the COVID crisis has really brought to the fore the issue of employment, and the demographic and health surveys and multiple indicator cluster surveys that we use actually have a question on employment, um, and we have that for over 4.8 billion people, but we can't use it because of how it's asked. And it's a big disappointment. And so if I had one request, it would be that that question could change. And so within the same data set, without too much of an unrealistic ask, because I know how financially constrained and long these surveys are, we could have data on informality that would enable us to capture it up close. Um, we have data on overcrowding and we could bring that in for more countries, but people don't agree on what overcrowding is. And so it's difficult because some places, yes, the, the thresholds differ culturally. Um, and uh, the, the need to look at migration and how the migration is impacting that is, is there a lot. Domestic violence is only in the, some of the DHS surveys. Um, and if clearly that has come to the fore in many places also. Um, 
Another really interesting question has come in, which this time asks, how far do you think the COVID infection and MPI deprivations map onto one another? Can you say that again? Oh, sorry. How far do you think the COVID infection and MPI deprivation map onto one another? What we don't know, because we don't yet have the data, um, we know in some places, you know, that COVID began as sort of a, um, having the more equal probability to attack to all people, but now the people in the upper part of the distribution of whatever variable you're thinking about are able to protect themselves. And so it is far more prevalent among the poor and that is likely to be the case. And so I've given the arguments why I believe it is more likely, um, but I don't know. And we, we don't, as I said, uncover, in, include all of the relevant variables, including we don't have in these data sets um, understandings of diabetes, of heart conditions, of lung conditions, respiratory infections. And so to, to really be precise, we again have to merge data with health records or with other data sources to try to be uh, better than we are right now in many, both the global MPI and national MPIs. Um, but national MPIs usually do have employment in them, so at least we have that in view. Um, but I, the, the reasoning and the reason I think that so many countries are starting with their MPI and extending it to look at additional vulnerabilities is that there's a sense that this group will be most affected. Fantastic. And there's a question as well from Kellyanne, um, which is really about your emphasis on what the MPI can tell us about where governments and donors should place the greatest sense of prioritization. And Kellyanne asks, when is it most appropriate for governments to focus their efforts on areas with the highest proportion of MPI deprivations? And when is it best to focus on the highest number of people in an area um, with high numbers of MPI deprivation. So should we be focusing on numbers in a particular region or proportions in a particular region? No, that's a good question. And it really depends on what you mean by focus. Because if the focus is the amount of money, then in a sense, you have to have each person being equal. And so you have to think of the number of poor. Because if you're giving out a cash transfer, it's the number of people times the amount of money. And so that's why you need the number of poor. For example, in the MPI, it may not be a cash transfer. It may be uh, a benefit. It might be access to services with appropriate social distancing, or it may be uh, something else, but the number is very, very important. But then if you have limited resources and you say, well, I need to focus on the areas where there's the most density um, of deprivations, then you look at the proportion because that might be where the national institutions would be overwhelmed or are not able to cope at the moment or able to cope with the expanded demand. They would have special um, uh, weaknesses uh, because of the higher proportion. So that, that might be a suggestion. Thanks very much again. Um, there's another question this time from Bernie Muneton who um, Asks, is asking for a little bit more detail about some of those trade-offs that you mentioned earlier between the, the cost of COVID-19, both economically, and then the cost of lockdown measurements on vulnerable communities. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could go into a little more detail about that, maybe. Yes, I think that that is that's really the heartache, um, is that, as so many stories have said, if they are particularly the urban poor with no reserves, um, if there's a sudden lockdown, they don't have jobs, but they also don't have food and they're locked in in very, very cramped quarters. And um, maybe even in, in communities where they, they can't socially distance at all or without washing facilities, then it's, it's really quite terrible. And what's terrible is partly the possibility that COVID would spread a great deal. But it's also that very sadly, there would be a cost in terms of lives and livelihoods that have nothing to do with COVID, but that are related to food insecurity um, and, and other causes. Um, so I think that the what all governments have recognized, it seems, is that you have to have strong measures, but insofar as you can, um, really invest in resources in the people who definitely will have 
a hit on their lives and livelihoods no matter what because of their immediate vulnerability you know to, to lack of food and, and water so I think um, there's a there's a strong trade-off how do you make it and how do you uh, decide when to lift it um, and in South Asia for example it's happening quite differently in in some of the different countries and other areas as well so uh, we are learning the world community what does work and what doesn't work um, but what I would want would be just a, a continual focus on the and curiosity about how the lives of the poor are going and and so a constant feed of information and what's most difficult I think is that when there isn't that information because we don't have survey data and we may not have proper collection mechanisms even from journalism um, then the policymakers are hampered because they can't make decisions that would protect those lives and so that seems to be a need right now is is obtaining um, greater information to inform that trade-off as well as learning from other countries as we amass a greater body of experience. Um, another set of questions but I'm going to try and group a few together. Um, a number of people in the audience really are concerned about um, the impact of COVID-19 on particular groups, um, particular people with particular identities um, within the general population. Um, so Caroline is asking about the effect on gender, Jonathan is asking about the impact on the elderly, uh, Daniela is asking about the rural context. Um, we're often told, I suppose, in, in many of these discussions that COVID-19 doesn't discriminate, that everyone is equally vulnerable. And yet the data tells us a little bit that that's not the case, that people are differently vulnerable. Um, so I'm wondering, based on a number of those questions, um, to what extent in the MPI, you're able to look at and consider the specific vulnerabilities of particular groups of people, uh, women, the elderly, um, rural populations, and what particular vulnerabilities they have and how you can respond uh, to those particular needs through your work? Yeah, no, those are very good questions. Um, so I think everywhere that we have worked in terms of the national um, work with governments, the elderly are a population of concern. And so very simply, you see what proportion of households have an elderly person, whether that cut off is 60, 65, whatever age limit that they need, what proportion of households have that? And it varies a lot between different regions of the country, different districts or municipalities. And how many households are intergenerational and in that they have um, not just older people, but others that may be uh, going out and so, or larger households. And so that information is useful in trying to identify risks of contracting COVID for the elderly. Not elderly, but you know, the people of a certain age, age cohort. Um, and, and that's very much demanded and I believe upon. In terms of gender, as we know, there's a lot to be said because there are different kinds of vulnerabilities um, in terms of the COVID um, fatality risks. We know that they are uh, on one uh, side less necessarily prevalent among women. And yet there would be other kinds of risks where women would be uh, more exposed because of their caring roles or uh, more exposed to other kind of uh, vulnerabilities from the overcrowding situations of either having to travel back and forth to care for a relative who's not living in the place or um, how food buying is done outside the home or obviously from domestic violence and internal uh, disputes. So uh, we, with the data that we have, um, we have usually focused on the household um, rather than the than the individual woman, because we don't have enough individual woman data about the woman versus the man, and so we're not going to that level, which is a big sadness for all of my team. I can say we're all very keen on gender data, um, so it's a big sadness and problem. But the national data sets we use usually do not permit that, um, and so we can't say much there. In terms of rural urban, it's quite interesting because. Usually the rural urbans are or, or rural areas are the poorest. 85% of the MPI poor people live in rural areas. But there is a concern, particularly about the urban areas, because of the overcrowding, because of the lack, maybe not rural landless households, but maybe other households would have food stores and grain stocks that would give them a little bit more uh, 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 security over a lockdown period, but the urban may not. 
So there, there's actually been a demand for studies on the urban poor and how their vulnerabilities may be more stark um, in this circumstance than is usually anticipated. Thank you very much again. We've had a few questions um, about the particular impact of COVID-19 on um, people working in the informal sector. Um, and I was, you know, I was wondering if you could maybe give a little bit of information, it's obviously quite early, but possibly about some of the solutions that might be might be available to sort of lessen that and mitigate that impact on those most vulnerable workers. Yes, no, that's a fascinating question. I'll give an example. Many countries have a tourism sector and that tourism sector now has stopped. It's just stopped almost overnight. And so there are all these people in hotels and restaurants and transport agencies um, in tur tourism and entertainment agencies that don't have jobs. And so there are of course surveys to understand what they are and what their needs are. And what's interesting about those is that there are also surveys to say, what do you want to do? <laughs> Given that at least in the short term, you're not gonna go back to your job in the airline industry um, because of its contraction. And so people are able to articulate um, if they would like to retrain as a plumber, if they'd like to retrain as an electrician. And one interesting factor about that in it, it has been an interest in agriculture, an interest in people who are in city jobs, in you know the, a different, in a sense, strata of, of uh, occupations, wanting to go back to the agricultural areas to learn and apply their skills, apply their education in a new way to the rural sector. And that could be a cause of hope, you know, because there will need to be, you know, increases and transformations there. Um, and so that's that's another good thing. And there's also interest in, um, in learning more of the creative arts of weaving or of painting and, and not forgetting the importance of those even during recession. People need to, poetry more than any time else. They may, they may need music. And so even if the economics of that is hard, I would say with Amartya Sen, you know, thinking of things of intrinsic value and permitting those career avenues as well would be, uh, would be helpful. But I think, um, yes, the data that are coming in is how they want to retool. And the answers are, are fascinating. Sabina, you're doing an amazing job responding to this huge volley of questions we're firing at you. Thank you so much for all these in-depth responses. Um, I think one of the things that seem to be people seem to be really inspired by is your call to action, saying everyone can get involved, everyone has a role to play in supporting the truly inspiring work you're doing. And uh, Roger has asked a related question. He says, Sabina has hinted at how the audience of this webinar may add to the capacity to disseminate the key messages relating to how MPI data can assist in targeting responses as they relate to COVID-19. Could she expand on this, please? So could you say a little bit more about specifically what you think people listening can do to get involved? No, thank you so much to all of you. Um, I think very concretely, one is that maybe not everybody knows these data. And so, for example, we are a small research center and we have Excel sheets on our website and a little interactive data bank but that stops there. It's not necessarily mainstreamed in with other data portfolios or profiles that are online. And so if you run across those, you might say, well, do you know this, these data sets? Would, you, would they want to carry them? Our data are in the public domain. Others are welcome to carry them. And so that's one kind of step. Another is wherever you are living, um, is looking at and making sure that if, if you're living in uh, countries that we cover, you know, is this information generally useful to uh, people who you know, who might be active in a, a particular subnational area or in a, a region? Maybe it could be of interest, maybe not. Maybe the survey is relevant, maybe it's too old. You know, so I'm not gonna make any grand claims, but where it's useful, um, then, then it would be perhaps a, a resource to draw their attention to. And another way would be, I think, just trying to realize that right now, people are already thinking ahead to the social protection phase post-emergency. And you know, the danger is that people are out of work, they're gonna need jobs. There's gonna be an influx of cash to try to restart the economy. And the people designing those plans 
may not necessarily be thinking how can these new jobs and new investments uh, also turn the corner in terms of poverty work. And so entering those discussions, however you can, you could write an article in the paper, you could um, blog, you could connect people on social media and retweet, but, but any ways that you have. And uh, I think we would be interested to know and, and to have suggestions because most of our time we're just trying to work on the numbers. <laughs> And I should say, I wish that my colleagues could also answer your questions because they'd probably give far better answers than I would. <laughs> I mean, they've, they've been pretty stellar so far, so don't worry at all. Um, one, one final question. You mentioned earlier during your discussion that there are sort of some quite new methods of data collection emerging. Um, and uh, I've lost it. Uh, Jorge Morales has asked, is there any future options to use data from mobile phones to measure multi-dimensional poverty, at least for poor areas where they do have internet access. Um, if not, are there any good examples of steps forward for sub substituting survey data? And I was wondering if you could sort of maybe talk a little bit about maybe the role of technology, maybe how COVID-19 has forced you and OFI to reevaluate your data collection methods and how that's going to have to change going forward. Yes, I think climate is the most evident um, goal that we had that all of a sudden changes we never thought were possible are happening. But in my little world, it's also with data. We never thought, you know, we would see such rapid innovation in non-traditional, non-face-to-face survey methods. Um, but the innovation is happening and we need the apps. So we need the mobile phone apps where there is smartphone penetration and where it reaches the poor. And I mean, really reaches them because if 95% are covered, one in 20 people aren't, and that's probably all the poor. So, but where there is good cell phone penetration or smartphone penetration, then, and where there is literacy, but some countries do have these conditions, then apps can be useful. You have to think about total, what Sir Tony Atkinson drew our attention to is the need to think about total error, not just a sampling error. Maybe you don't have a good sampling frame, or maybe the poor are under or over sampled, but also, Who's answering the phone? Um, are they honest or are they trying to game it? Are they taking the questionnaire seriously or not? Um, can you recontact them or is it interrupted? So I think understanding that is really uh, vital because otherwise we don't know, you know the quality of the data. So we can't really look you in the eye and say, this is, this is what we have. These are the numbers that we have. So I think that's an area that needs a lot of rapid innovation. Um, but hopefully we'll we'll get it. And I know many are working on that topic now, including in, in our own department, and you may hear more from them later. Um, and I think the other question which comes up with the technologies is, um, how can we share data back? So in terms of sharing the data, it's not for us, you know, in some institution or in some university or in some capital city to have all the data on poverty. How can we share it back so people in have that information and talk about it and can act on it locally. And that's, I think, a big mistake. And it's so important because, uh, I'll be very brief, but in the moving out of poverty study, um, which asked poor people uh, what was most responsible for their move out of thinking it would be government or an NGO or a faith-based group or family, over 70% said it was their own initiative. And they actually need to engage the protagonists of poverty and impart information in ways that they can understand and act on um, so that I think this process is also catalyzed and accelerated. Thank you, Sabina. Um, we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to ask one last big picture question. Um, you're probably in very great demand at the moment amongst policymakers and governments. And I'm wondering what the, the one sort of big piece of advice you would give at the moment to people responsible for development aid budgets, um, faced with pressure from electorates, pressure to cut spending, reduce aid budgets, what's the one thing you think they should be focusing on? What's your key message to those people responsible for bilateral and multilateral aid budgets? So I, I'm not gonna say that more money is better, um, but I can say that if the, investments are made well, um, 
then I think there is a chance, as I said, with the example of Sierra Leone, to uh, make the terrible tumultuous time that we are in of COVID um, have a historic reduction in poverty in a monetary sense and in a multidimensional sense. We have to carry on with our interest in both, though we're talking today about multidimensional. Um, and so the budgets need within them to really have a core focus on services of health, of education, um, support for informal workers, support for children, um, and pensions and retired people. So that, that just has to be a core um, priority. And also engaging people in, in trying not just to manage a crisis, but to invest in, in a future sequence that would lead to a, a historic reduction. I think that mindset shift is the first thing that I would hope for, because right now it's so easy to just look at the economic figures, look at what's happening um, with the recession and, and be a little bit dispirited. Um, but I think if they're able to do that, and if we're able to show also that judicious amounts of investment do have a huge impact, then that will help them to talk back to the taxpayers and say, look, this is, this is what we can do. Um, even as during Britain, when there were food shortages and a reduction in the total food supply availability, um, by better distributing it, by better investing it, um, it led to reductions. And so I guess that would be the hope. We recognize it's going to be a tough time and resources will be tight. Keeping our eye on the ball, as it were, um, hopefully could, could make a change. Thank you very much, Sabina. Um, this has been incredibly inspiring, I think, for everybody listening. Um, you've really given us a sense of how research can bring practical change and that a research agenda that you've been working on for many years has real practical applied relevance to the here and now. And I think this is exactly the kind of ethos we want for this series, to be offering a sense that the development research that's taking place in Oxford can have a practical impact and that it can be accessible and comprehensible. And I think what you've done is make really quite complex work available and accessible to everyone who's listening. So thank you so much for what was a brilliant talk, for engaging so substantively with the range of questions that have been put for you. Um, it's really been a terrific opening to Oxford Development Talks. Um, I also want to say thank you um, to Harry for co-moderating from Oxid, and in the background, my colleague, Law Algarabi, uh, who's been dealing with a lot of the tech to get all this set up. Um, these kinds of webinars are only possible because of the support we get in the background from colleagues. And finally, before we go, please do join us for the next Oxford Development Talk. It'll be on Tuesday, the 26th of May at 2 p.m. British Standard Time. So not next Monday, but next Tuesday. And it'll be by Professor Zhao Lan Fu, on the topic of China's growth strategy and what it means for the world. So another huge, important um, and significant topic of our time. Um, but I want to thank also all the audience members who have joined us. Uh, it's been great to have you and please do join us again. Thanks, Sabina. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, stay safe and stay well um, and see you again for the next session. Bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>